Madonna is the superstar who broke all the rules on her journey from homeless waif to Hollywood sex siren. Brace yourself for shocks and surprises as we exclusively enter the private world of a superstar you were never meant to know. This is Madonna Exposed. The material girl with blonde ambition has had a rocky year. Her kinky book drew scorn, her too hot sex movie a yawn. Until now, she's been able to cloud her past, present and future in a smokescreen of camouflage images. But not tonight. Madonna tried to stop this broadcast, and here are just some of the reasons why. For the very first time, you'll see outtakes from her first movie, A Wild Child Uncut and Uncensored. Hear her very first demo tape, the one she never wanted played. Check out the provocative photo she posed for as a starving unknown. Meet the woman who sacrificed everything only to be fired. She breaks her silence at last, as does Slam, the sperm dancer who saw what really happened behind the scenes of the Blonde Ambition tour. Plus, people from Madonna's past reveal first-hand secrets of the girl they loved and lost, the girl they only thought they knew. The stepmother. Style, really. The school child. Really accused of lesbian. The girlfriend. Looks adversity. And the boyfriend. Wow. There's also the burning question about Madonna's sexuality today. Tonight, hear the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the naked truth. From New York City's Palladium Nightclub, it's Madonna Exposed. With your hosts, America's number one showbiz reporter, Robin Leach, and television's pop music personality, Eleanor Mondale. Welcome to what's certain to be a very controversial two hours. So controversial that Madonna tried to silence us with various pressures. It failed. When we tell you Madonna's story, you'll understand why. Tonight, you won't officially hear her sing or watch her dance because she banned us from airing any of her own videos. But for everything else she tried to suppress, including even more secrets from best-selling author Randy Tarabarelli for a bombshell book, stay tuned and hold on tight. You know, I've been a big fan of Madonna's for her whole career, I think, but she really lost me on the book. Well, she lost me. I think she lost all of America with that <laughs> sex book. Now, before our party gets underway, we do recognize that some viewers may be offended by Madonna's artistic expressions. So, viewing discretion is urged. Also, a word to Madonna, because I know that you're watching. How can someone who blasted MTV over censorship try to gag us? What is it that you want to hide? Now, one hour ago, you, Madonna, your lawyers, your manager, and your publicist were given a special telephone number to challenge anything that's said tonight. This is the phone, Madonna. It reaches me direct. It reaches our viewers direct. So it's your call, your choice. Well, as you can see, the party here is really in full swing. But amongst the guests here, the buzz on Madonna is that for the last few months have been so controversial. No, you're not kidding. Some people say any publicity is good publicity, but you know, there's a lot of flack over those negative headlines. Well, one thing's for sure. Madonna's well-schooled in scandal. Pop culture's lurid lightning rod began conducting her own storms of current sexual controversy back in 1990. When her Justify My Love record was deemed too raunchy for MTV, she spun the ban into pure marketing magic. The libido torpedo turned the song into a video single and peddled it for $9.95. She even justified sex for sales as a campaign against, of all things, censorship. Madonna then pulled off another cunning stunt on her maiden publishing venture in 1992. Hyped as the media event of the year, she unleashed a pillow picture book of kinky capers and erotic text. It made headlines when Japan banned it. Even more headlines when the FBI was called in to investigate some of the pilfered pictures. The stroke of genius was keeping it under wraps. Result? Madonna mania to plunk down $49.95 a copy. Some fans even lined up for a dollar a peek in private back booths. Partially shot in Miami Beach, in public no less, these exclusive behind the scenes show some of the most X-rated moments the censors would allow on television. Don't worry, we won't show you Madonna's water sports with Isabella Rossellini, nor her sun lotion motion with Naomi Campbell, and especially not the potty training with Vanilla Ice. 
Its literary launch was a star-studded media blitz. Only the guests seemed to be in on the joke. But kinky sex could be unleashed on the public as a slick sales tool. Amid the leather and lace extravaganza of domination and degradation, Madonna made her grand entrance dressed as an innocent Heidi. She had the last laugh amid couples feigning sex in a mock-up dungeon. America lapped it up. Proving that s and also stands for sex and money, her book sold a half million copies in the first week and also spawned an album. But after three late-night airings, MTV pulled the plug on erotica, citing its lusty lyrics as too hot to handle. Seizing the moment, Madonna again blasted them for censorship. Yet, it's the same outspoken champion of free speech who tried to silence us. Madonna's next artful shocker was at a fashion benefit when opportunity knocked. PR-wise, it ranked as a crowning moment. The world's press clamoring to capture a one-woman headline machine, giving them the kiss-off. Madonna grabbed even more attention by hinting at a bisexual world with comedian Sandra Bernhardt. A catfight followed later when she accused the superstar of snatching away her girlfriend. A myth Bernhardt vocally complained to radio's controversial Howard Stern. Sandra was really mad. Sandra's one of those women who says what she feels. Model gal Ingrid Casares reportedly met a topless Madonna hosting an all-girl 1991 New Year's Eve party. Sparks flew, apparently causing such friction between the former couple that New York columnist Richard Johnson claimed the star KO'd Sarah's big record deal. Madonna began 1993 with Body of Evidence, a sex movie touted as a bombshell that some critics said was instead a bomb. They cringed at its contrived kinkiness, even laughing during the crime drama that Madonna wanted to be taken seriously. After just a few weeks, it vanished from movie theaters. The word on body is that rigor mortis had set in. Has she gone too far this time? Has the turn on become a turn off? Predictably, Madonna could care less. I think that I misunderstood, but I think that's okay. I don't expect everyone to get everything that I'm about. If Madonna has any skeletons left in her closet, author Randy Taraborelli knows all about them. Our first guest up here, away from the party and in the VIP room at the Palladium, wrote best-selling biographies on Michael Jackson and Diana Ross. Now he's taking on Madonna. And tonight, you get the advance peak right now, before the full release of his new book, Shock Value. Randy, welcome. How you doing, boy? You know how to throw a party down here. It is a party. Yeah. Now, Randy, you've spent over a year researching Madonna. So yes. I want to ask you, what is left about Madonna, the woman that is of shock value, that shocked you and is going to shock us here tonight? Well, you know, I thought in beginning the book that Madonna was pretty much an open book to all of her, her fans. And I discovered that really she is an open chapter of an otherwise very closed book. She's a very controlled woman, a very controlling woman. I'm fascinated by this lady. She, she is so contradictory in so many ways. Is she a tough, what we would call, mogul? Is she a ruthless, iron-fisted woman behind oh, the desk of power? Definitely, but she also has this, uh, this uh, uh, driving need to, to be accepted. You know, and, 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 but she's very smart, and I think most people don't get Madonna. And what I wanted to do with my book was I wanted to explain her. You know, I wanted to, you, you look at pictures of Madonna and she's writhing on the floor without any clothes on, and you think you're just looking at, a, at pictures of a naked woman on the floor. But what you don't understand about Madonna is that she is constantly uh, testing the limits of, uh, of society's uh, pros and cons and sexuality by, by overstepping those boundaries, and that's what she's all about. She's about overstepping her boundaries. There was a romance with Warren Beatty during yes. the filming of Dick Tracy. Yes. Now, for once, Madonna didn't get her way. It didn't turn out the way she wanted it, right? No, Madonna was very much in love with Warren Beatty, and she really wanted to have his, his, his children, and, and she thought that relationship would work. And, you know, Warren has been with a long string of lovers, from, from Joan Collins to Barbara Streisand to, you know, to, to Julie Christie, and the list goes on and on and on. Unfortunately, Warren's mother, Kathleen, who was in her 80s, didn't like Madonna and felt that Madonna uh, was just a little bit too risque for her, for her would son. Would Madonna have had the babies with or without marriage to Warren? I don't think 
think Madonna believes that marriage is necessary to have children, but, but she does believe in romance, and I found her to be very romantically inclined, and she would do anything that she could to please Warren. Warren had said that she's a nice girl, but you can't take her anywhere, you know? Because you never know what she's going to say or how she's going to look. And Madonna threw a surprise birthday party for Warren, and to, to appease him, she dressed down. She was very, very uh, conservative with, uh, with uh, you know, the, the a beautiful gown, and, and uh, she tried to make herself the ideal woman in, in his life. And also, she gave him a very expensive painting for a birthday present, and I, found, I find the little stories to be telling, you know. Uh, Warren put the painting away behind the couch and didn't really want to be bothered with it. Madonna went to his home, she went and found the painting, she got into the kitchen, got a hammer, hung the painting over his couch, and when Warren got home from the studio, he was really annoyed by that because he felt she was taking over. You know, she does like to take over. That's Madonna. Um, Shock Value is going to tell us about Madonna's plans for Marilyn Monroe in the Michael Corder picture. Yeah, Ma Madonna's been asked by uh, Dino De Laurentiis to, to play Marilyn in, uh, in the, the film version of The Immortals, which should be very interesting. And also, she, uh, she has her sights set on Honey West, which was a, an Anne Francis vehicle in the 60s. Uh, Anne was nominated for an Emmy Award for her TV show Honey West. And Madonna, I understand, plans to take the Honey West character to, to the movie, so that should be very interesting too. I just hope that Madonna doesn't wind up the way that Marilyn wind out. No, because uh, Madonna is much too much in, in control of her life and she knows exactly what she wants and she knows exactly how to go about it. But Marilyn really didn't know what she wanted. All right, well, you're going to go back to the party and hey, enjoy I can't wait. yourself. Madonna Exposed continues. Just, just who is that girl? To answer that question, let's go back in time. Madonna's early years contained key turning points. Crossroads where an ordinary girl grew up to be quite extraordinary. Robin takes a journey to Madonna's Michigan hometown. Our Lady of Perpetual Commotion is haunted by a trinity of traumatic childhood crosses. Her strict Catholic father commanded catechism before cornflakes. Her mother died when she was just five. Madonna's role as house mom was taken over by her dad's new wife. Such upsets in her formative years helped make Madonna who she is today. I think that had a lot to do with me saying, well, you know, after I got over my heartache, um, saying, well, you know, I'm going to be really strong then. Or if I can't have my mother, I'm never going to be, I'm never going to, I'm going to, you know, take care of myself. Born 1958 in Bay City, Michigan, and named after her mother, Madonna Louise Veronica Ciccone was the third of six children. Though she would later reinvent a hip, ethnically mixed neighborhood, her first eight years were spent in middle-class suburbia. Her Italian-American father, Silvio, worked as an engineer in Pontiac. Father knew best. He enforced an unbendable daily ritual, early mass, then off to parochial school. At home, Papa preached that television was evil, rationing it to a Saturday morning treat. Then, the heartache of her mother's slow, painful death from breast cancer. She was um, beautiful and very loving and devoted to her children, very children-oriented. The loss of her mother shattered the youngster's confidence, according to one Madonna expert. She became so insecure that author Chris Anderson claimed that she also felt doomed to cancer. He says Madonna threw up over fears even of leaving the house and became so obsessed with her father's attention, she crawled into his bed night after night. Her favorite babysitter recalls Madonna soon learned how to win her father's gratitude. She was the woman of the house. She was the one that the uh, younger siblings would look up to. They would check with her first to see, is this what's going to go on? Is this what we're going to do? So they did look to Madonna for guidance. She basked in her father's approval for three years, only to be upstaged by strict live-in housekeeper, Joan Gustafson. Six months later, Silvio wed the blonde and told his kids to call her mom. An eight-year-old's world came crashing down. The upwardly mobile Chiconis then moved to Rochester, Michigan, where the family still lives today. Madonna's super success hasn't affected them at all. We're still living in the same house, and we still have the same lifestyle, really. Our life has not changed that much. But back at the elementary school, Anderson claims the young Madonna was walloped with rulers and had her mouth taped shut. At age 12, freedom at junior high. Two years later, maturity with the in crowd. She smoked, plucked her eyebrows, and went from cheerleading to chasing boys, lickety-split. 
Her guidance counsellor says Madonna was a maverick even then. One of the days when she was doing her cheers before the crowd, she had flesh-colored tights on, and when she did her pyramid and flipped over, it, uh, from a distance, looked like she was nude. It shocked. It shocked the coach. She flaunted her sexuality at a school talent show. She got out in front of the whole student body and in the gymnasium and danced vigorously, using a lot of body movement to uh, a popular song at the time. And it was pretty controversial. And I looked around at other faculty to see if any eyebrows were being raised. Her father wasn't real pleased, but she was a, a bright student, talented cheerleader, honor roll, involved in a big brother-sister program thespian group and there's a real positive image that she maintained throughout her high school that she doesn't always get credit for it. Packing a 140 IQ, Madonna founded the drama club and played an ingenue. It wowed her teacher. When the spotlight came on her, um, everyone was focusing on Madonna and she was wonderful because of, of that vibrant personality and the charisma that she had even in those days. At age 14, Madonna began taking ballet lessons from an instructor who also took her cruising Detroit's gay bars. Her teachers never knew what their straight-A student was up to. She was taking dancing lessons after school when a lot of kids were out having Cokes and burgers and having a good time. Emboldened by her walk on the wild side, Madonna then seduced a school hunk in the back of his caddy, according to Arthur Anderson. He was 17, she was 15. The taste of taboo turned her in a whole new direction. She was uh, experimenting with unusual clothes. Um, I know there was a period of time where she just suddenly didn't shave her legs, and I remember she started like putting safety pins in her clothing. Desperately seeking difference, she won a dance scholarship and took her first apartment. Her roommate, now a choreographer, recalls an 18-year-old smitten with dancing. Her obsession was her work. I've never seen anybody work so hard. Whitley says Madonna was determined to seal that friendship. She embarked on what seemed to be, to be a very calculated campaign to be my friend, capital letters. And, and I resisted at first, but little by little she won me over. She was very warm and tender, funny, thoughtful, uh, and determined. She just seemed determined to break down whatever limits and boundaries I up. The duo became partners in more than hijinks. We would go after class sometimes to candy stores, um, fast food stores, just to get a snack. And she would come out with stuff I knew she hadn't bought. And she started to convince me that it was something we could do together. And I became enthusiastic about shoplifting. Apparently, that wasn't all Madonna was eager to grab. She was very huggy, very touchy. Uh, it took me back for a while, but I, uh, I got used to it. And after a while, it, it just became part of the way we related to each other. While Whitley was away, Madonna poured out her feelings about female friends. Oh, my Whitley, I miss you so much already. You have left bits of yourself everywhere, but they make me want to be able to touch you even more. Last night, I went out dancing at the Blue Frog with Linda. I've been using your ID to get in everywhere. You left it in your coat pocket. Well, I sure had a good time. People were not shy in expressing either disgust or delight in the way Linda and I were dancing. We were verbally accused of lesbianism several times. Boy, it sure was fun, but I always wished it was you the whole time. The girls spent the summer of 78 skinny dipping in their secret stream, but Whitley knew it was the last of their fun and games. Madonna just couldn't stop talking about her next move. She wanted to go to New York and just dive right in. Welcome back. To Welcome back to more bombshell revelations about the real material girl on Madonna Exposed. Ten summers ago, I made my first trip to New York City, my first plane ride, my first cab ride, and I didn't know where I was going, I didn't know what I saw, and I asked the taxi cab driver to drop me off in the middle of everything. So he dropped me off in Times Square. Anyway, I was completely awestruck. Incredibly, that 1978 cab ride cost half of the 37 crumpled dollars she had in the world. 
For the first time in her life, Madonna faced homelessness in the ultimate urban jungle. But this was no wide-eyed innocent from the sticks. The 19-year-old college dropout already had an immaculate conception of her own future. Chris Anderson's book records a stranger inviting her to crash at his apartment, her accepting without hesitation and staying two weeks. A counter job at a midtown Dunkin' Donuts then earned enough for a six-week workshop with the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. Flat broke again, she later bragged to friends that she scavenged trash cans, wolfing down the buns from discarded burgers. Then came a night job as a hat check girl at a Manhattan landmark. Its manager recalls her virtually destitute. She was a frail gal. Uh, I thought that perhaps uh, her meals here were about the only ones that she had during the day. The bare facts of survival in the big city meant stripping to the bones for money. Ultimately, some of those nude pictures would come back to haunt her. One of the artists who hired Madonna recalls her eking out a meager living from modeling. For the very first time on television are the portraits that kept her from starving. That was her livelihood. That's how she got paid. We always paid her in cash. It was basically $7 an hour in those days. What I remember most about those years is the fact that she was always moving from one place to another, staying with friends, uh, staying with other groups, uh, always sharing living quarters. And, and so it was hard to keep track of her. She was very cooperative and she was uh, always willing to do very energetic, very enthusiastic kinds of poses. Some apparently more enthusiastic than others. In 1985, fans were stunned by a steamy spread from way back then that simultaneously surfaced in dueling center spreads. The sexy layout that really got Madonna upset was from a 79 session with Martin Schreiber. He paid her $30 for 90 minutes. What was Madonna feeling at the time that she posed for these? I don't think she was really enjoying doing this, where some models come in and they're, they have a whole presence about them and they don't, they have no qualms. I felt that she was doing it just because she needed the money. Author Chris Anderson says the photographer wooed the waif, whining her at his loft studio and treating her to expensive candlelit dinners. But she was no one-man woman. Those who knew her recall her nickname was McDonough, an uncharitable reference to the number served. One of her first conquests was a musician. They met at a downtown disco and hit it off at once. Anderson says many men helped her to the top, but it was Dan Gilroy who taught her guitar chords while they shacked up in an abandoned synagogue. Oy vey. Madonna didn't just join Dan's band, she took over as lead singer. Ambition, artistic difference, whatever caused the bust up, Dan's not telling any tales out of shawl. Back in Manhattan, Madonna moved into a cockroach-infested fourth-floor walk-up in the grungy East Village. There, she crashed with graffiti artists, watching one become the darling of the art world, the late AIDS victim, Keith Haring. Another roomie from way back was dancer Erica Bell, with whom she shared a very special friendship. Amid the challenges of Alphabet City, she told me that for Madonna, survival was as easy as avenues A, B, and C. How tough was it at the beginning for the two of you? No furniture, no money. Uh, we didn't think of it as tough. I mean, at the time, we didn't think of it as, we're living a tough life, this is so tough. We had a lot of fun. I think she's the type of person that looks adversity in the eyes and thinks, I, could, I can beat this if there's a problem. She's a pretty strong woman. Strong enough to steal the spotlight from a band in a pioneer music video as seen in this rare clip. Cast as a lowly dance extra, Madonna grabbed glory from a bit part. The producer recalls her shamelessly out boogieing the competition. I do remember talking to her often during the shoot, talking at her because herself and uh, um, her dance partner, Martin Burgoyne, uh, were dancing very provocatively, constantly in front of the camera. So I kept saying, can you move back, can you move on to the side? Even back then, um, she was showing a very flamboyant, attention-grabbing uh, attitude. Wanted, fiery woman for low-budget movie, no pay. The ad in the backstage newspaper made no mention of it being an erotic thriller, nor that it would take two years to make nor that a rape would take place in a crowded coffee shop. 
Though she didn't fly off to Hollywood as a result, Stephen John Lewicki's film did showcase her talent. Madonna may not be happy about it, but one outtake that was saved proved strangely prophetic. Everyone brags about making changes in their lives, but I know too well that to realize that you want to do something and then to actually get there, it's two different things. You can make the effort, you can have the desire, but it's not enough. You need something more. Madonna must have taken those words to heart. Joining me now from the party downstairs is the director who put her in the picture, Stephen John Lewicki. Stephen John, I've got to ask you, you advertise in, a, in the backstage newspaper for actresses, you weren't going to pay them, but there must have been a lot of actresses that still wanted a lucky break. Why did you pick Madonna out of all of them? Well, Robin, it was quite interesting. I, I put an ad in Backstage magazine that was asking for a fiery, dominant brunette girl in her 20s um, who could uh, act and uh, dance. And I got something like 300 responses, most of which were 8 by 10 black and white glossies with summer stock theater resumes on the back, all of which were incredibly boring. And, and as I was getting completely discouraged by the process, out popped this three-page handwritten uh, letter by a girl named Madonna. And it said something that was, you have it with you. I, I do, I have a little bit to read and... Uh, Please do. I, I was uh, taken by this. I, she said in here, I knew I either wanted to be a nun or a movie star. Nine months in a convent school cured me of the first disease. During high school, I became slightly schizophrenic as I couldn't choose between the class virgin or the other kind. Now, here was a girl I thought had some interesting possibilities for certainly, the movie. Certainly a sense of humor and actually... No uh, question about it gifted little writer in there. Right. Now, I, I saw the movie. Um, some people have labeled it soft porn. It really isn't, but uh, there is nudity. There's a scene in there where Madonna is with her sex slaves. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd like you to just tell me a little bit about that while we take a look at it. Well, it was kind of interesting uh, doing this scene. It was, for the most part, unscripted. And Madonna, as you can see in this scene, shows a lot of passion. Um, but she was very comfortable with her body, and at no time did I ask Madonna to take her clothes off. It just evolved while we are doing the scene. Um, she was very comfortable with it, and it, it's really very touching to watch this. It's, uh, you know, far from being pornographic, it's, it's very passionate and interesting. Got to ask you, because she had no problem taking her clothes off sure. while, you, while the cameras were rolling, <laughs> but she had problems afterwards. Now, why did she try to stop you? Well. I think uh, Madonna used or tried to stop the movie more as a publicity stunt and as really kind of an interesting use of uh, her power. Um, she really did put a wholehearted effort into uh, trying to sue it. She was a third-rate lawyer, I think, who tried to, uh, you know, when they came to court, they had no case prepared and the thing was thrown out of, uh, of court immediately. So I think it was really just to get more publicity um, certainly didn't didn't hurt the movie at all, and uh, I thought it was kind of a birthday present. It's good. We're going to leave you now with some uh, never-before-scenes, behind-the-scenes footage of the making of a certain sacrifice. This came way before Truth or Dare in her career. That's correct. correct? And, and there was some fun on the set. Right? Oh, sure. Madonna was always up and uh, had a lot of energy. Um, always knew her lines and was always able to improvise. Uh, and as you can see in this clip, she was uh, having fun singing on the set. As a matter of fact, this is the first time I saw her sing. Okay. Everybody at the party is waiting to listen to a television premiere. It's Madonna's 1979 demo disc, the one that actually helped launch her career. As we listen to Love on the Run, 
please remember that later Madonna fought to stop this ever being played. Well, I think it still could be a hit. Vogue-wise, Madonna has come a long way since her first manager and mentor, Camille Barbone, discovered her. She's never talked about those early days until tonight. Welcome to our show. Thank you, Robin. It's nice now, to you've be never, here. ever given a television interview about those early days. Why are you breaking your silence? Well, it, it's, it, it's come to a culmination for me over the years. I mean, I've read numbers of interviews by Madonna, people writing stories, other TV shows. And you get the impression that Madonna did it all alone. And I'm just here to, to say that there were a number of people in the, in the old days, and there are a lot of people now that helped to make Madonna the star she is. That's great. You get a lot of credit for discovering her. How did you actually find Madonna? Well, um, our paths crossed at a, a place in New York City called the Music Building. It's 12 stories of nothing but music, uh, recording studios, rehearsal studios. I owned a studio there. We kept banging into each other uh, in hallways and elevators, and she was just a very interesting person to watch. Eventually, I got to hear a demo, and uh, eventually I went to a show, and uh, she, I saw her live, and I knew in an instant that What she was did you be big. know in that instant? Madonna has an extraordinary ability. She understands what I call it's, it's body-mind coordination. She knows how she looks. And when she's on stage and dealing with the music, she gives the audience a feeling of being inside her and knowing what she's feeling. And it's, it, it's in very few performers. Uh, I'd say only the ones that have made it very, very big, like a Michael Jackson, like a Bruce Springsteen, possess it. Camille, we know that nothing ever happens overnight stardom in show business. Uh, those were early days that were struggling, that were painful. They were terrible Just how days. broke was Madonna? Uh, she came to New York, uh, she had two suitcases and a guitar, no place to live, she was living in the music building. Homeless? Yes, definitely homeless. Um, she didn't have any money for food, I mean, she would go on a date and have dinner. She would ask someone to loan her some money. I mean, she really came to New York with just her dream. And uh, when I found her, it was important to make her feel secure and taken care of. So the first thing I did was move her out of the music building. She wanted to live on 30th Street. She found a small room. She loved it. She lived there two weeks and was robbed. They only took her photographs. Really upset us both, so I moved her right out of there to a small uh, apartment on the Upper West Side. And what we're going to do now is listen to one of the very first records that uh, Madonna made with you. It is called High Society, and we're going to take a look at some of your exclusive photos at the same time. Wonderful. Now, Camille, you invested a lot of time in, in Madonna. Mm -hmm. um, what was the reaction, first of all, for when people heard that record? Well, um, ironically enough, the, the music industry was not taken by her, her, media, her, her demo tapes. I mean, it, it was more Madonna the person, more the presence. I, I found that uh, the best way to have a good meeting at a record label was to bring Madonna because she's a personality. It wasn't ever this great musical genius. It, it was the entire package and her ability to sell herself. So there were a lot of no's along the road in the early day, but you deeply believed she was going to wind up being a superstar? I, of course. I mean, I often felt like Chicken Little running around saying the sky is falling. Everyone's going to be, what? I don't get it. I don't understand. I'm saying you will understand. There's, there's a bigger vision here. And um, I, I think the first go around, 
uh, yielded all knows, everyone. And uh, it's a process in the, in the industry. I mean, you do have to go through a number of, uh, of passes towards uh, your, your ultimate goal. And ultimately, I, I got Columbia Records to really, really get involved and listen and, and pay attention to her. Now, unfortunately, there came a rather nasty parting of the waves that wound up in an in a ugly lawsuit. What actually happened? Well, um, while I was working with, uh, with Columbia and trying to get uh, a deal, uh, Madonna was, was basically working with uh, another set of people in the music industry. It's a very funny business. Um, you don't know you have a hit until people try to steal it from you. Uh, then you know you have it, and it's time to really scramble. And um, unfortunately, my company was four years old. And um, I really believed in what I was doing with Madonna, and I had a certain approach. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I think with, with every part of Madonna's life, I wasn't moving as quickly as she wanted to move. Did you pretty much sacrifice everything and put everything else on the back burner to, to put it towards stardom? Yes, I begged, I borrowed. Um, I cajoled people to loan me money to uh, to uh, begin her career. It takes a lot of money to put together a career. Uh, I lost everything in the process. I lost my, my studio. I had to drop all my other artists, but it was worth it. I knew she would she would be the ultimate success. Now, unfortunately, you didn't get in on the winning end of the return. Have you ever figured out how much money you may have lost because of the fact that she went on elsewhere? Well, first off, I did get on the winning end. Um, I wanted to discover and develop and, and manage a superstar, and I did do that. So for me, it's a, it's a total success. But for the sake of dollars and cents, I think it's about 30 or 40 million dollars. Um, I had a contract for 20% of her gross. So I, I guess over the years, that's the figure. I think, though, that's what's wonderful is that you're still smiling about it and that tonight you shared some secrets with us. I, I learned a lot. I mean, it, it was a wonderful experience, and I'm applying it to the, the clients that I have today. That's great. Let's take a listen now to one more of Madonna's never-released tapes, and we're going to watch it along with some never-before-seen photographs from Camille Barbone's collection. This is the music of Get Up. got that sound. Camille, thanks so much for playing the tapes and for such an amazing background on a star we only thought we knew. I think we should go back to the party for some more fun. Wonderful. Thanks, Rob. Just ahead we'll meet the former boyfriend who clinched Madonna's first record deal only to lose her love. Stay with us. Just months before Madonna struck gold in 83, she was a struggling unknown craving for attention with a raw performance at a New York night spot. This dynamite footage shows Madonna on the very brink of her big break and making all the right moves. You're confusing me. I don't know if you want me. They sure were key steps to stardom, because only a year later, Madonna was atop the charts. Her success was largely her own making. But as our dear friend Alan had discovered, she also had a little help from her friends. The diva of downtown disco made tracks for the top almost by divine plan. She slipped her demo disc, Everybody, to DJ boyfriend Mark Kamens, sat back and waited for the bang. First single went to number three on the Billboard dance chart and number one on WBLS radio in New York City. 
Her 83 debut album led to a European tour and put her on the cover of Rock's Bible. It was perfect payback for all those years as a struggling unknown. A top record promoter recalls her unstoppable force. And those records went on the radio, got played in the clubs. You went everywhere. You heard Madonna. She upstaged Rosanna Arquette in 85 to become an instant movie star in Desperately Seeking Susan. Inspired self-parody at the MTV Awards, then spawned Madonna Mania. Madonna! Madonna! Like a Virgin hit sales exceeding six million. Music insiders say her success was inevitable. Bobby Shaw knew she was going places from those early club performances. When Madonna moved, people grew. She had charisma, but I guess the one thing that she really had was the drive. Ah, but which drive? Biographer Chris Anderson says Madonna and Erica Bell committed moving violations in record company limos. He describes them cruising through rough neighborhoods for jalapeno hot Latino youths. Erica denied to Robin anything spicier than a backseat burrito. I mean, it was this car that you could just take anywhere in New York City and say, wait for me. And they would wait, you know, it was this new thing, you know, it's like poor girl plays rich. Anderson's book also records them trolling discos for men with promising moves. Erica says poppycock. They weren't into that kind of workout. Well, it didn't start until usually after midnight. And uh, would go until usually four in the morning, at least. And uh, we would just get in the middle of the floor and try to just take up as much room as possible and dance as hard as possible and really work out. Erica says their lust for life was always governed by driving ambition. We knew we had to get up and go to a studio, or she was going to the recording studio at the time. And, you know, there's a certain line that you never cross. And I think the two of us, and I think she still can watch the fire, but doesn't get too close to let it burn. I was always kind of uh, surprised that, that uh, she could handle it so well. I thought, uh, this is kind of a game, but she was very serious. The producer of the seven-time Platinum Virgin album recalls Madonna was always acting as a star, even before becoming one. In the very early days, she and I would go out together when we were trying to just sort of develop our relationship and figure out how we were going to work together. And I remember going to a restaurant with her, just a cheap little sushi bar on University Place. And I remember walking in, and I'm hearing all these people going, who's that girl? Who's that girl with Nile? Who's that girl? That girl ultimately sold over 75 million albums. Nile says such super success comes from knowing what people will buy. I'm always amazed at Madonna's incredible um, judgment when it comes to making pop records. Uh, I've never seen anyone do it better. And that's the truth. I've never, ever seen anyone who's got a more impressive track record than Madonna. That sentiment is echoed by a producer who gave her more than hits. Madonna never gets it wrong. She has the ability to try new things and always be right. And that's really amazing to have see an artist. I mean, at this point, she's had 21 top 10 hits in a row. There's never been anything like it since Elvis Presley or maybe the Beatles. Our DJ for tonight's live Palladium party is one of New York's hottest, Mark Kamins. Now, Mark is one of Madonna's old friends, and you really got her career started. Yes, I was DJing at Dancer Terry, and Madonna brought me a cassette, and I played it, and the crowd went wild. They did. And we finally got a record deal, and I produced the first single. Now, do you still talk to her? No. Well, she's probably watching. If you have a message for her, go ahead. Uh, Madonna, if you'd like to make another record, give me a call. All right. Thank you very much. Now, as Robin discovered, Madonna's live life is indeed one for the books, the record books. Luke Perry, Katie Lang. Luke Perry, Katie Lang. I... I'm so confused. So are we. Madonna is a sly sexual contradiction. Playing Pop-Tart Temptress one moment, Ladies Loin Ranger the next. A writer who has studied her concludes that she really gets off by showing off. From the time she was five years old, she realized that by using flirt, being flirtatious, using feminine wiles, got her what she wanted. And it got her attention. And she seems to have a desperate kind of neediness for attention. Motivation aside, those touched seem to then crave her. Some to possess, others to worship. Most are like her first video producer, drawn closer for reasons they know not. She's, you know, a nice-looking person, but she's no model, I think. But once you get to know her, she's extremely sexual, very alluring, very strong, yet you want to be close to her, you want to touch her. Madonna's super sex secret, less is more. When you're independent, when you do your own thing, 
when you are your own person, you do whatever you want to do. When you pull away, when you know you're not so concerned with impressing, then the other person is very interested. Technique aside, it all adds up to a diva's dark dilemma. A world-famous sexpert analyzed her need to be adored. In my mind, Madonna doesn't think that she's very lovable to a man deep down. And so she places an impossible burden of proof on any man who would love her. Her sexual history reveals a legion of lovers, beginning with the 15-year-old Michigan Minx's first time with her high school boy toy. Fast forward to the East Village vixen graduating with gusto. One early conquest has never broken his silence until now. Madonna was definitely a, a sexual being, but not in the same sense of wearing, you know, lace panties and uh, torpedo bras. I mean, it was just kind of an animal sexuality. She called me up one day and said, get your gorgeous Brando body over here. So her, her line was, her, her approach was always very direct, I mean. She didn't, you know, mince words or, or wait around and be coquettish. I mean, she definitely went after things she wanted. The DJ she dumped after he helped launch her career says Madonna believes in safety in numbers. It was frustrating being her boyfriend because Madonna always had two or three boyfriends at the same time. And I guess every, every boyfriend played a different role. Another casualty was a hit record producer she even took home to meet Dad, and serious enough to talk marriage and babies with. But they split when her wanton ways made him jealous. Still, he's no sourpuss. Madonna is one of a kind. There will never be another one like her. Her 1985 marriage to Sean Penn was a high-tension power connection doomed to crash and burn. Madonna's explanation? Our opposites attract. Though Madonna filed a police report pertaining to Penn's bedroom violence, the whisper persists that she still holds a candle for him. Despite his subsequent children with actress Robin Wright, an ace paparazzo believes they are still destined for each other. He is the most important person that's been in her life so far. She really loves him. I think she still loves him. As for that 1990 tumble with her Dick Tracy co-star, it's now suggested that Boffo box office may have been the real driving force. The gal who really knows her says no way was Madonna serious, probably just being sociable. I don't think she was that interested. No. I think she dated him because she could. More knots were tied with nude pin-up Tony Ward. That was eventually snuffed out, supposedly over love in leather. The paparazzo says no way. Madonna just couldn't keep track of her men. Like in New York, she has James Albright as a boyfriend, the bodyguard. Out here, it's John Eno. He owns the uh, Roxbury nightclub. So she has her boyfriends, she, she has her lovers wherever she goes. As for her much-touted taste for ladies, this exclusive home video with former gal pal Sandra Bernhard says it all. Before their bust-up, they sure made beautiful music together. Then along came a doe-eyed Cuban beauty. Insiders say Madonna snatched her from Sandra, who was good and miffed. The writer who broke that story says Madonna is brazen about her bisexuality. People have seen them nuzzling and kind of making out at parties. It's definitely on some level beyond just two gal pals uh, that just like to go to the mall together. Uh, that just like to go to the mall together. Michael Musto sure does a beat around the bush when it comes to Madonna's taste. Now we're going to meet the lovely Janet Charlton, who's the gossip columnist of the Weekly Star magazine. Janet, Hello. welcome to the party. The hot news is this weekend, Madonna back with Sean Penn, yeah, spotted you like on the that? beach together in Malibu. Right. Do they still, excuse the pun from Body of Evidence, burn the candle for each other? Oh, you know, Madonna has never given up on Sean Penn. She always said he was the love of her life. And recently, even Sean Penn started swinging in Madonna's direction. For the first time, he told friends, gee, if I were married to her now, we would never have gotten divorced. I have a new appreciation for her. And this is the first time I'd heard that. That was a few weeks ago. So I'm not surprised that they're back together, at least seeing each other. And I'm sure Robin Wright is ready to split her wrists. <laughs> 
We hear all these things every week from you. It's fa fabulous. <laughs> now, is there a real man in, in Madonna's life at the moment, no, or is she still you know, on the prowl? She's very vulnerable right now. She does not have a serious boyfriend. She's been seeing John Enos, but it's just kind of a cat and mouse kind of thing. She, she caught him driving around in her car with other women. <gasps> so she's not totally thrilled with him to begin with. He's a very handsome guy, though. And they're having fun together, but it's not real love. Now, Madonna's got a handsome new co-star in Snake Eyes with actor James Russo. Yes, Anything James Russo. Anything happening between the two of them? Well, I mean, it might have happened, but it didn't happen. Actually, Madonna invited James Russo out to dinner, I heard. And he said to her, is it business or pleasure? And she said, whatever you want. And he replied, well, if it's business, why don't we just go to lunch? And if it's pleasure, I'm going to have to take a pass. He, he doesn't want to be flavor of the week for Madonna. And he didn't want to ruin their working relationship. So maybe he was really smart about it. And they're still friends and working together very well. How are the relationships on the set of Snake Eyes well, between she Madonna and, and the rest of them? Abel Ferreira, her director, and Madonna are, are battling every day. There are screaming fights all the time. He's making her gr grow her black roots for her character, and she really doesn't like that. And she has to go out at night looking kind of sloppy now. So she's not happy, and she's not happy because he is the boss. He's really telling her what to do, and Madonna is accustomed to calling the shots. And she owns Maverick, the production company, so she's battling with him every day. Now, we do know from everything we've heard here tonight and from the weeks and months of research that we've been, Madonna does have a fascination with ladies, and there was a lady called Ingrid. We heard that Ingrid was way out, and Nina, who was the star of Black Orchid 2, is now the new girl in. Well, now, Ingrid is a friend of Madonna's. They've been friends for quite a while now, and I think they will be remain friends for quite a while. She's not out, totally. They're still friends. And as far as Nina Semetsko, Madonna was wooing her to be in her movie, Snake Eyes. She had a part for her. So I know they were talking about that and getting friendly, perhaps at a party, discussing the movie. I don't know of any kind of relationship that they have. I know Madonna enjoys the company of women. She's attracted to women, and she likes to flirt with the idea of romancing women. Well, there but are I think rumors. her true love is men. Yeah, but there are strong rumors of her bisexuality. There, there is are. experimentation with the same sex. And Madonna doesn't true deny it. I, yeah, Madonna does not deny that, as so far as I know. therefore, we must assume it's true. I, I think it's probably true to an extent, but I believe in her heart she really wants a boyfriend like everybody else. Get married, white picket fence, yeah, and a baby. Yeah, she's more normal than you think. She really wants a steady guy. You heard it first. Thank you, Janet. You've certainly raised a few <laughs> eyebrows out there tonight, and believe it or not, there are even more Madonna surprises. Welcome back to Madonna Exposed and the Rock and Roll Party live at the Palladium in New York City. Our friend Cody Mundy had a unique experience. When you co-star with Madonna and Who's That Girl? Now, is she difficult to work with? No, Helena. Actually, on our set, Madonna was no prima donna. She was great to work with. Remember the old days when you used to have sex without a condom on a Sunday morning? That's how great it was. She was great, not a problem. I don't quite know what to say with that, so thank you very much, Cody. <laughs> Madonna's winning a unique reputation on and off the set. But as we discovered, she's very serious about the movie career. Where are these eyes? Name three classy, sassy sirens of the silver screen. Mae West, Marlena Dietrich, Marilyn Monroe. And you can bet your aisle seat that Madonna wants to make it a foursome. The only city she hasn't been offered the key to is the one she wants acceptance in so very much. A respected writer who spoke to Madonna about her Hollywood dream says that she's the ultimate wannabe. I wouldn't say just Hollywood stardom, but film stardom is absolutely one of the most important things in, in Madonna's career. Compounding her ache for acclaim, a dazzling debut that promised much yet delivered little. Entertainment Tonight's movie critic says she had it handed to her on a platter. Who could ask for a better showcase to get yourself started on screen than Desperately Seeking Susan? It was a perfect part for her. So perfect that you questioned whether she was acting at all. And that's a valid question. Was she acting? Was she sort of being herself? I don't know. Madonna has blamed her big screen also rans on unkind reviews, but many industry insiders claim her movies flounder at the bottom line, the box office. It was a field day with the abrasive stars, but Shanghai Surprise didn't sink because the couple were dubbed the poison pens. Its failure was a paltry $2.3 million in ticket sales versus the fortune it cost to make. 1987 saw fans pack Times Square for the premiere of Who's That Girl? Alas, moviegoers across the country said, who cares? Even earning over seven million, it lost money. In her 1993 Howler to be released on video cassette, Madonna played a killer using sex as the murder weapon. Yet the first casualty was Madonna herself. 
The critics had their fun, but such Hollywood reviewers as Martin Grove know that ultimately America makes the call at the box office. Body of evidence, it was off 73% in its third weekend in release. That's terrible. And in fact, it's clear that at the box office for movies, Madonna is still a nobody. <laughs> Madonna, I'm sure, doesn't understand why the picture hasn't worked. Probably thinks it was the marketing or they didn't spend enough or the title was wrong or the release time was wrong or not enough theaters or too many theaters. Anything but that Madonna didn't work. One wonders even why she wants to be an actress. She's very successful doing what she did best originally. And, and, and you know, why that isn't enough maybe says more about her than, uh, than we'll ever know. A top sociologist says Madonna's cinema sin was turning basic porn into a yawn. I think that, uh, that those, um, those scenes in Body of Evidence are, are boring. I think that they are mechanical. I think they lack any kind of eroticism. I think that Madonna has made a serious mistake in um, her choice of this vehicle and her choice of doing those scenes. Infuriatingly for Madonna, not being the star in a movie virtually guarantees a hit. She may have worked for minimum scale dollars playing Breathless Mahoney in Dick Tracy, but she helped haul in a $103 million box office bonanza. She went to bat as one of a team, and it happened again. Madonna helped hit a $107 million homer. But her solo star movies grossed just $13 million average, barely covering the production costs. Those who know say she can't see the obvious. All that stands between the material girl and stardom is better material. I talked to her about not succeeding as a movie star so far, and she felt that a lot of the problem had to do with the idea that she's such a strong personality, it was hard for her to get roles in which she could transcend or people could forget who she was. But that problem didn't arise when she faced the toughest critics of all. Back in 1988, they were ready to attack during her five-month stint on Broadway. But most loved her, even adored her, even when she apparently confused one performance with another. It felt like really good sex. <laughs> her driving need to prove herself as a modern-day Monroe may be the only challenge left. Leonard Maltin believes she can do it. I think she has the potential to be a great movie star. And she even has the potential to become a, a really good actress. She's not a bad actress now, but I think, you know, in time, she might even prove to be better by working at it. Working against her, who she is and what she is. No ordinary starlet. Madonna raged when Disney was unable to change her shooting schedule to accommodate her timetable. She fired off a facetious fax to producer Joe Roth. In it, she spat. After being involved in such projects as Revenge of the Nerds, you are certainly qualified to speak about the art of acting and great filmmaking. Eerily, she signed it Dida, Madonna's alter ego name borrowed from a 30s silver screen goddess. Her next movie will be Snake Eyes. Critic Martin Grove can't wait. I think Madonna's impact on Hollywood has been nil. She hasn't been in a movie that she's carried that's worked. And I think people want to know, you know, what, what is it about Madonna that makes her think she can carry a big movie? Wish me luck. She's gonna need it. Whispers of pre-Madonna type arguments on the set of her new movie, Snake Eyes, include Madonna insisting the entire crew so as not to disturb her concentration. Now, do you think in her next movie she'll listen to the critics and tone down the sex scenes? Nah. <laughs> Eleanor, you be sure to keep our party hot while I'm up here with Slam. Now, he's never before gone on record about what really went on behind the scenes of Blonde Ambition. Welcome, thank you for being with us. When I saw the Truth or Dare documentary, the impression was that you were all one happy family with Madonna sort of like mum in charge of everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, are you still a happy family today? Oh, no, we're definitely not a happy family anymore, Why? that's for sure. Because after the, after the movie Truth or Dare, it's like, I never talked to her anymore, nothing. And even during the, during the tour, I mean, the movie makes it look like we were this big family, but it was not like that. I mean, we were a family, but not like she was the mother and we would go to her with, our, with all our problems. It wasn't like that. So the family broke up after the movie had been finished? Definitely, but it, it wasn't even that close of a family doing the whole tour. Really? They just ma made it look like that, it but it wasn't it that close. It looked so tight while you were all there, having so much fun. Now, there was also a controversy, if my memory's right, about uh, this becoming a very successful movie and you all sort of being forgotten, right? Yeah, definitely. What happened? 
So because when we always knew it was going to be a documentary, the movie, and then she told us, well, if the movie is going to be become a success, you dancers will get some money. Then it became a success in Europe, everywhere, and we never got a dime, nothing. Donato, nothing. Well, I'm sorry about that. That's OK. Now, <laughs> is there a Madonna that we see on the screen that doesn't let us see who she really is? Who is Madonna, really? To me, what I know from Montoya, she's very, really deep, deep inside. She's a very sensitive, sweet person. And she's actually also very insecure. Very insecure. Especially with other women around. Because then we would have parties and there would never be beautiful women around. Because it makes her, she panics, she freaks about that. Was that a Madonna rule? Rule one? Definitely, yeah. <laughs> o -o only man. If you had the opportunity, because I know that Madonna is watching tonight, <laughs> to, uh, to talk directly to her, I would like you to talk directly now to Madonna and okay. give her a little message from your heart, Slam. Okay. Uh, Madonna, what I always wanted to ask you, because I thought we were really good friends and I trusted you, and not because who you are or what you do and everything. I just don't understand. I mean, you could have at least given me a phone call or something to let me know about the movie and everything, but just nothing. And at that point, it really hurts me. It, it hurt me, but I guess that's just life. Well, I, I hope that at some point you can patch up. You'd like to be friends again, right? Yeah, but... But you'd also like to get paid again, right? Definitely, definitely. So there you go, Madonna. Give him some money and definitely, you'll all be happy yeah. again. <laughs> but you've got your own career now building for you, which we wish you a lot of luck with. Thank you, Slam, for being with us here this evening. What's very clear is that where Madonna is, there's controversy. You're going to get the opportunity to see and hear Slam before the end of the show. Remember, where there's controversy, there's also a lot of money to be made. Okay. It's non-conformist, radical. This is something that's not taught at the Harvard Business School, which is probably why she's making more money than IBM or General Motors these days. Maverick. It's independent and extremist. What you have to understand about Madonna, I think almost every waking moment is work, and she probably dreams about her work. Maverick. It's bohemian renegade. I mean, what is Madonna desperately seeking? Uh, that's what I really don't know. But whatever it is, it keeps her out there. Madonna is maverick. More precisely, it's her new multimedia entertainment company formed with the giant Time Warner. People Magazine's Madonna expert believes the mega deal will finally satisfy her deepest craving. The hungriest artist alive, I think, is Madonna. I really don't know what she wants, but I think that she's determined to get it and get it threefold. And I think that she's got the energy and the savvy that uh, having her with a, a huge company is probably a smart idea. <laughs> What Time Warner gets for its up to $60 million investment is multifaceted Madonna under one label. It's records, music publishing, television and movies. It's merchandising and books, and it's all controlled by the one-woman money box. Should the conglomerate not recoup its investment, she'll have to refund the company from her music earnings. But don't worry about Madonna. She negotiated a whopping 20% royalty for every album sold. Maverick's publishing debut was her sex book, a half million copies at 50 bucks a pop. Little wonder Mighty Forbes magazine and its editor ranks her as America's smartest businesswoman. Madonna has something better than a Harvard MBA or a degree, and that is she has a sixth sense, what you might call a green thumb. Just as some people can grow flowers better than the rest of us, they have a feel for it or take a recipe and turn it into something beautiful, she has a feel for entertainment. She has that sixth sense both in entertainment and in business, and she's combined the two in a way that is an extraordinary success. What she does is she took a leaf from Detroit, the auto industry, which the auto industry forgot, and that is the annual model change. She has gone through a number of personas over the years. It's always hit the market in a way that it benefited to her, at least in terms of money and particularly with publicity. And she also hasn't stood still in the sense of being passive in the conduct and running of her life. She has plenty of accountants, lawyers, handlers, PR people, but she runs them rather than the other way around. The man behind Madonna reportedly receives 10 to 15 percent of everything she earns. That's enough to make the manager a millionaire many times over. 
Vanity Fair's Madonna Maven got a chance to quiz him about their financial goals. Freddie and Madonna share one thing in common, he told me, which is that, you know, enough is never enough. And no matter how successful they are, they still want more. And he said, we'll never have enough, never. What I felt when I met her was somebody who was absolutely, totally, completely focused on her product, which is herself. And um, she really is so driven and so maniacally driven and compulsive about her work that you realize that you're in the presence of somebody who's just sort of like a locomotive coming down the track. Madonna's work ethic even extends to workouts, which are public events amid paparazzi and fans. Yet the star who may just have sold her soul for a negotiable image sets rules for her probing public. I draw the line when I get to my house. <laughs> And I go up my driveway, that's where the line is, you know. Wherever I live, you know, that, that should be sacred. She has three homes. First, the Miami mansion for which she paid a hair under $5 million and used as a setting for her sex book. A G-strings throw from her sign of the times, the $5 million retreat screams Tinseltown status, hit movie or not. The nine-story concrete castle was once overseen by mobster Bugsy Siegel from a 160-foot tower. Read into that what you will. Then there's the Manhattan co-op filled with the Material Girls Museum quality artwork. It's eclectic, yet strictly mega-dollar. The prize collection ranks Madonna among America's top 100 collectors. But she's also a star who gives some back from her incredible fortune. Her charity is AIDS. A cause near to her heart since so many of her friends have died from the dreaded disease. She is a top fundraiser. And I'm hopeful that we can conquer this disease. Thank you. How rich is Madonna? The record fortune has set her for life in multi-millionaire status. People's David Hutchins has the last word on the material girl. Madonna is not going away. That, that's a guarantee. But... Uh, it's the direction in which she goes that I guess keeps us all out there, reading, watching, listening, and being exhausted. <laughs> now, Robin, you're the expert on fame and fortune. How much of a material girl is she, really? Well, Eleanor, in a single year, she's earned as much as $31 million. And that works out to over 590,000 bucks a week. And that's just about a dollar for every second of the day and night. Smart and stylish Eleanor is on the runway with the dressed up, or perhaps I should say, undressed report. Blonde, brunette, Madonna will do just about anything to cap her look. Her inspiration is either a gag or she really believes she's a work of art. I am my own painting. See, I'm, I am my own experiment. I, so I am this, I am my own work of art. To critics who call her a shameless marketeer, the icon artist says to bleach their own. It's not so calculated. It's however I feel at the time. I don't sit in my room and go, okay, in three weeks, I will have brown hair, I will wear a green dress, and I will say five nasty words in one day. I mean, it's not that way. It's, just, it's the way it is. It's, it's very spontaneous. Fashion's evangelist only has to turn her quaff for disciples, devotees, and just plain wannabes to follow suit. Madonna became the idol of international fashion designers by turning haute couture inside out. Underwear became outerwear, a concept as thunderingly simple as it is sinful. The mere thought of clothing Madonna makes hearts skip a beat in the heady world of runway and rail-thin girls. But not every fashion honcho is quite so enamored with the girl who undressed for success. Robin talked with the prickly designer of the annual worst dress list. Never one to mince words, Mr. Blackwell was on form. She's an insult to American women. I think of Madonna as, as trash. I think of Madonna as the dictionary describes the word grunge. Top photographer Francesco Scavulo disagrees. After focusing on the world's beauties, just one look was all it took to convince him that Madonna was destined for greatness. It was magic. I mean, the camera loved her. I mean, the camera just wanted to keep taking pictures. Madonna is, just had a wonderful, beautiful look. She was fresh. 
She was young. She had a very individual way of dressing. She slowly began to know more and more what she wanted and who she was and what she wanted to look like. And that's very important. She knows what's good. Like it or not, Madonna's impact on fashion is enormous. With me now is Charlotte Krupp. She's an editor of Glamour magazine. Now, what do you think about that, the impact that she has? I think Madonna's impact is considerable among a very small segment of the population. Like? Girls 12 to 16, but adult women who have their own personal style are not rushing out to buy a gold cap tooth. Now, Don't you're an agree? adult woman, but your business is style. What do you think her best look was in all the history of Madonna? Since Madonna's look really appeals to young women, that like a virgin look where she was just wrapped in femininity, but underneath was substance and strength and real independence. It was a great look because it's easy to do. You can get it at the mall, and it was just so much fun. It just had such a spirit about it. And people are still wearing it, actually. Absolutely. At the malls. And, <laughs> and the lingerie business just went through the roof. Now, what do you think her worst look is, absolute worst? Bottom, absolute yes. worst, Heidi gone mental. When Madonna <laughs> appeared at her book party, she looked like a Swiss who missed. I know, she I agree had with you. Little, um, looked like little cones for braids, for braids, lots of cleavage. Uh -huh. And she was carrying for effect a little stuffed animal, a lamb, and it just didn't work. It's but supposed to be innocent and childlike, but. Now, we're, we're looking into the future a little bit here. For an exclusive first in fashion, we asked top designers to look into the future for the material girl's next look. Charlotte, now, what do you see in the vision? We've got Dolce & Gabbana coming up here. What does this say well, to you? Well, Dolce & Gabbana, if anyone would have a read on the Madonna, it would be them because she's a big fan of theirs and vice versa. She's very into androgyny right now. <laughs> she's wearing a beret right. and she's wearing a lot of menswear. But since it's on paper, forget it. No now, way. Carol Little. She's already doing Carol it. Carol Little is 10 years behind Madonna. She was doing the belly button way back in 1984, and those bell bottoms are straight out of holiday. Okay, Nicole Miller has taken a leap here. Nicole Miller, sorry, Rasta Madonna, no. It's too much East Village street urchin. We saw it in Desperately Seeking Susan with the tons of bangles all over it. No, wrong. Now, what about Andre Von Pierre? Well, that's very funny because a lot of people think that Madonna should become like a Mother Teresa right now to do a reversal of the image that she's currently in, but no, forget it, never, we'll see that. And Betsy Johnson? This is funny, I mean, Betsy obviously heard that Madonna does want to have a baby and she does want it to be a gay boy, but... Oh, she said that? Yes, <laughs> yes, but no, maternity Madonna, I don't think we're going to see that. Now, I have one more question. Uh, how important is it for an entertainer like Madonna to keep reinventing herself? Well, Madonna has made the makeover a career move, and what she's done is up the stakes for other singers that are like her. Paula Abdul, mm -hmm. Janet Jackson, every time they do an so album now, they feel that they have to she'll represent just keep their doing look. It. Right, and, but we've seen how Madonna has changed from 180 degrees. Her looks now is really dark and depressing. Well, I can't wait to see the future. Thank you, Charlotte. Many believe that Madonna is a frontline fighter for feminism. Others argue she'll say just about anything to get noticed. We're going to meet two experts with very opposing views on Madonna. We're going to go head-to-head -head with Susan Carpenter-McMillan, a spokesperson for the conservative pro-family media coalition. And then Adam Saxton, a staunch Madonna supporter whose bestseller, Desperately Seeking Madonna, chronicles the artist's impact on modern culture. The question, does Madonna use her enormous influence in a positive or negative way? Adam. Uh, I think she uses her influence in a positive way. Um, her self-appointed task is to be as outrageous as possible, and uh, she has uh, she's done that job to date very well. Adam, I think that is so ridiculous because this is a woman who thinks nothing but going to the bank. This is a woman who promotes violence against women. This is a woman who promotes animal sex. This is a woman who, who is the most awful role model that you could ever imagine for 13-year-old children. Let me give you a perfect example. When her book that she just had shows all of her so-called little perverted fantasies. In there, 13 and 14 year old children who sleep with their dogs, take their dogs for a walk and have fun, call Little Rover. She had a dog as a sex object 
for her pleasure. Now, I'm sorry. I don't think that that is the kind of role model that she should be. Adam, how do you respond to that? My response to that is very simple. This sex book of hers was marketed to adults. It's for adults. It's for adult consumption, not for children's consumption. It shouldn't have been read by children. The big question that we're asking everybody here tonight is, has Madonna gone too far? Again, I don't think she's gone far enough. Yeah. Not far enough. Not far enough. What she's all about is uh, going beyond all of the prior boundaries, uh, offending everybody if she can, and she hasn't yet done that, and so I think she's going to continue to to move in that direction. And I so think now that's what, terrific. What, what next, Adam? Do we now have the toilet life of Madonna? We're going to have Madonna wipe it in a couple of years? I mean, there's really nothing left for this woman to do. She's degraded women. She's degraded animals. She's degraded children. She's degraded men. She's degraded all of society. There's nothing left but, you know, the, the, the toilet life of Madonna. I disagree. I don't think she's degraded oh, any of these do? people. I think what she's done is to encourage debate, discussion, and I think there's not enough of that in, in, uh, in American life, and I think anybody who encourages more of that is doing the right thing. Is there a little bit of a double standard at play here about what men can do, what women can't do, and oh, vice versa? absolutely. Uh, put it this way, um, Madonna has done all sorts of things that she would be getting away with very easily were she a man. Uh, we're not sitting here discussing whether Mick Jagger is disgusting, whether Elvis Presley went too far, whether Jim Morrison overstepped various bounds and so forth. I'm not going to take sides, but the thought of seeing any of those gentlemen doing some of the things that Madonna's done scarifies me. I have got to tell you, that is an outrageous answer, and I think that's very typical male of you to say that, because Madonna is surviving because of the double standard. I'll tell you, if you went to a fashion show and uh, unveiled your maleness, you would be arrested. But Madonna can go to a fashion show and show up topless, and she's called chic. I'm sorry. This is a woman who is telling men, look at my breasts, not my brain. I find her offensive. I, I, it, for, Susan, for, should she be a good role model because she is such a superstar? Well, I'll tell you, we were talking earlier, and I've got to tell you, if you think Madonna is a feminist, Jeffrey Dahmer is a vegetarian, she absolutely is harmful to women. She's gone too far. We've already got a society that's sliding downhill, and what this woman is doing is bankrolling how far she can push the limits. Adam? Where is it written that it is Madonna, uh, Madonna's job to be a role model? Again, we no, never asked... Should she have the responsibility because she is such a success? She never asked for that responsibility. Again, neither did Elvis Presley, neither did Mick Jagger. We don't hold the, those people uh, accountable in a similar way, and I don't think we should her. The only reason we do is because she's a woman, and she's being sexual, and she's been successful. You keep mentioning her success, the degree to which she's taking this all to the bank. Do we punish Donald Trump? Do we pu uh, punish Lee Iacocca for being successful? No, but Donald business? Trump doesn't no, we show don't. up at a social affair bottomless. Nor does Madonna. She shows up topless. And men go around topless all the time. Oh, please, I no Adam, let's that. not get in. Let's not get into the discussion of body parts right here. Let's the bottom not. line is she's pushed it too far, and she's a disgrace. Before we rejoin our party, let's hear from two other Madonna experts. The first is Dr. Stuart Fishoff, a professor at California State University. He's currently working on a book about stardom, why some people have just got to have it. The media psychologist specializes in what makes celebrities tick. His studied analysis lets him look right into the mind of Madonna. Is there anything wrong in somebody wanting success to this magnitude? No. It takes a certain kind of single-mindedness to, to want to achieve the stature that she wants. But for the most part, I think it's what drives people and whether they have a life outside of their stardom. I think there's nothing wrong with ambition. There is something wrong with blind ambition. What happens when Madonna runs out of track? Is this a classic case? That's a tragic question. I mean, right now, she's a kind of a, a rebel without a pause. She's just going on and on and on in her one-trick pony style. I see Madonna reaching a point where a suicide gesture would not be surprising because her sexuality is going to run out and she can't continue that. I mean, otherwise she becomes a grotesque caricature of herself. So, so long as she can maintain her kind of physical allure and the, and the makeup and the energy that she expends, she can still play that neurotic card. That's not going to work forever, unless she gets a more diversified ego portfolio and she opens up other, 
other avenues for her talent. It doesn't look like acting in films is it yet. Uh, she's going to be f find herself in a dark corner of her mind. And that's where she doesn't want to be. And I think it's at that point that she might make some kind of gesture toward suicide as a cry for help, as, as relief from the, from the pain. Sobering words indeed, and let's hope that it never comes to that. But I think we all prefer to look on the bright side, and there is more than one way to view a star. Our second guest is a respected astrologer who discovered some amazing surprises in Madonna's chart. Our own shining star, Eleanor, has television's top stargazer in her sights. Yes, Robin. Now, Joyce Gilson looked into Madonna's future, into her ultimate fate when she studied her astrological profile. Joyce, what is the most stunning revelation that you found in the stars for Madonna? Well, the most stunning revelation is, first of all, that she is going to be involved in a lawsuit involving some contracts that she was involved in. She's going to be a hostile witness. Secondly, a lover is going to write a tell-all book, telling all, not <laughs> just about her, Madonna's sex life, which, of course, we know a lot about, but about the contract. She has not been paid probably as handsomely as she has announced she has been. My goodness. So maybe she's not worth all those millions. <laughs> okay, now what about men? Is she going to get back with Sean Penn? Is there going to be another man to fill his place? What's that? There's always going to be men for Madonna, of course. <laughs> but let's look really what she's looking for is a good relationship, and she's probably going to want a child. Mm -hmm. She's not going to look at about the men that are around her right now. She's maybe going to look at a sperm bank or even consider... Yes, a sperm bank. A sperm bank right. or art artificial insemination <laughs> in some way. However, I do think in about three or four years, she's going to get married to a very average man, probably an accountant, an accountant type. Now, this doesn't mean he might not be a mega millionaire, but he's going to be kind of a brown-shoed kind of a guy. Now, will she have a child after all these attempts? Yes. I with the husband she... or with the sperm bank? Well, sperm bank, I think. She's, <laughs> she's going to do things in the normal order of Hollywood, child first, then husband. Mm -hmm. But she's also going to have other children. She is going to be breaking new artists and while she's not going to be on top forever. Yes, that was my last yeah. do, do you think she'll always be on top like she's been for the last no, okay. I think that she's going to be somewhat, her career is going to parallel Frank, Frank Sinatra's. She's going to be on top, then she's going to pull back, but uh, she's going to be launching new artists. She's going to be probably on the cover of Forbes. She's going to be very interested in health concerns, not just AIDS, but she is going to make victimization or take that to a new high, some maybe health scare that she has mm -hmm. that really makes the, the public look at something else beside the AIDS epidemic. So you think Maverick will do well, her company? In that I whole? think her company will do very well. I think she'll change advisors. I also think she'll do a duet with Michael Jackson because both of them oh. will need a comeback. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Joyce. Thank you. All right, from all of us at the Palladium Nightclub in New York City. I'm Eleanor Mondale. Thanks for being with us. And I'm Robin Leach with the last word to Madonna. Now, we gave you an opportunity to respond. We're sorry you chose not to. We all wish you the best of luck. May your successes long continue. We're now going to let our party rock on with Madonna's favorite dancer from the Blonde Ambition Tour, Slam, and his debut song, Bring It. Good night!